on tonight's episode of Mr. Norris's In Case You Missed It. We look at the Trail of Tears, how it came about, what happened, and why we still learn about it today. Hey, hi, hello, and what is up, everybody? It's your host, Mr. Norris, the history teacher with the good hair. And today we're going to be talking about a little topic called the Trail of Tears, and we're going to get into it in just a second here. Wearing the glasses because my contacts bother me. Got the cast on because I tore a ligament in my thumb. So get used to this for the next month or month or so. I know I'm uh, still 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 trying to. All right. Uh, usually in our videos, we usually throw in some humor, some jokes, share some laughs, um, have a good time. Tonight's going to be a little bit different. Uh, just considering the topic that we're talking about, the Trail of Tears, it is one of the saddest, darkest chapters in American history, um, and inarguably one of one of the worst pieces of legislation and things that our country has done uh, to a group of citizens in our country. And we're, we're going to have to get into that. It is a very important factor, very important part of the legacy of the presidency of Andrew Jackson. And it really is what he's most well known for, uh, unfortunately. So let's dive into it. In the early 1820s, or excuse me, in the early 1800s, 1820s, 1830s, even into 1840s, uh, there was still a large presence of Native Americans in the Southeast United States, typically in states like Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Florida. Uh, and the tribes that we're gonna focus on that were there were five tribes called the Five Civilized Tribes. They are the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminole tribes living in that Southeast region. Now they began to have issues, and this goes back for a while actually, with white settlers in the Southeastern states who are encroaching upon their land uh, and getting into disputes. And around the 1830s, uh, 1840s, what makes matters even worse is in some parts, uh, and, and most particularly on Cherokee land, white settlers actually discover gold. So that increases and heightens uh, people wanting to move onto those lands and try and take land from Native Americans. Congressmen in the Southeast at this time want to do something about this. And luckily for them, they have a president in office who has never been a fan of Native Americans uh, and looks at them as inferior people. And in fact, if you read some of Andrew Jackson's journal entries or things that he wrote to colleagues, he refers to Native Americans as savages, as inferior people. Uh, he had no love lost for them. So around 1830, Southern congressmen are able to push through a law or an act called the Indian Removal Act or Indian Relocation Act. And basically what it said is that those Southeastern tribes, uh, the five civilized tribes that I described, were going, going to have to leave their homes and then move uh, about a thousand miles to what is now currently Oklahoma, and that would be designated as Indian Territory, where they could stay. This gets passed through Congress, and President Jackson signs it into law and makes it effective in 1830. Now, while it was brought forward by you know Southern congressmen, could Jackson have vetoed this law? Absolutely, he vetoed more laws than the first six presidents combined. So he could have done something about it, but he agreed with this policy, and that's kind of why it sticks to him. Um, Obviously, trying to kick these people out of their homes is bad enough. But the funny thing is that we like to think of Native Americans sometimes by what their stereotype is and what you see in movies and pop culture as, you know, these, you know, wild braves with war paint who, you know, are in constant perpetual war with white settlers. And that's just not the case. These five civilized tribes were people who were really seriously trying to, as best they could, uh, adopt and adapt to white culture and American culture. They wore regular clothing. Uh, tribes like the Cherokee, they had their own language, they had their own alphabet, they made their own newspapers, they had their own governments, wrote their own constitution. It, 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 the, this notion, this stereotype that they're you know, wild savages, if you will, is just not accurate and not true. And the fact that people in the Southeast wanted them out so badly just goes to show the rampant, for lack of a better word, racism at the time. Could they have coexisted with these people? Probably. They chose not to. They wanted their land. What makes this even more wrong and even more disconcerting on the part of the American government is that the land that they were trying to take from these tribes was really the last bit of land that was left available to them. And what I mean by that is, let's take the Cherokee tribe, for example. By this point in the 1830s, the Cherokee had already surrendered about 90% of their land. The land that they were trying to keep was 10% of what they had originally had. So you kind of look at this and say, you know, how much is enough? Uh, as far as the American government goes or, or the U.S. settlers go, right? How much do you really need to take from these people? Anyways, the Indian Relocation Act gets passed and it says that these people have to, you know, pack up and move to this Oklahoma territory. 
And they try to combat it as best they can. The Cherokee are probably the tribe that put up the best fight. They signed petitions. They sent letters to Congress, to representatives. Uh, and the most effective means by them trying to fight this is a case called Worcester versus Georgia. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the case, but basically the, the Cherokee tribe sues the state of Georgia for their right to their land. And the fact that Georgia and the Georgia militia is not only not doing anything to keep settlers from coming onto their land, they're actually kind of promoting it. So they sued the state of Georgia. This case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And you would think for this time that the Supreme Court is obviously going to side with Georgia against the Cherokee. Incorrect. The Supreme Court actually makes, you know, what we can see as today is a just ruling. They rule in favor of the Cherokee and they say that Georgia is in the wrong, that this land through treaties is Cherokee land and Georgia settlers have no business on it. And they rule in favor of the Cherokee that they have the right to their land. When President Andrew Jackson hears about this, he is furious. He is absolutely furious. Remember, he doesn't want these people there. He actually makes a statement saying, great, they've made their decision as in the Supreme Court. Now let them enforce it, right? Remember, the executive branch, the president, they are the commander in chief of the armed forces. They can dictate what the military does. And what Andrew Jackson plans to do is ignore the Supreme Court ruling and bring the US military down to the Southeast and forcibly remove these Native Americans. It's about this point in US history in about 1832 where the US Army starts forcibly removing these people from their homes. I mean, marching down there at gunpoint, making men, women, children, the elderly, the sick, whoever, gather up whatever they can take and literally march almost a thousand miles to their new home. Uh, this begins in 1832. It's not completely uh, completed as far as the five civilized tribes and especially the Cherokee until 1838, which is actually after President Jackson leaves office. However, it's his policies, it's what he signed into place and it continues uh, into the presidency after him. Uh, this becomes known, especially the trail of the Cherokees who put up such a valiant fight to keep their land as the Trail of Tears. Why is it referred to as the Trail of Tears? Well, obviously, if you're leaving your home and everything you've ever known and you have to travel almost a thousand miles someplace you've never been, that's going to be sad to begin with. You put on top of that, this was a long, arduous, hard journey for these Native Americans through blistering heat in the summer. Uh, and some of the months actually fell more towards the winter months and and you know they had to suffer through cold winters and there are people that are dying along the way. Again, sick, elderly, children, these people weren't excluded for having to make this march. Uh, so there are people dropping and falling. It's estimated in the decade between 1830 and 1840, 60,000 Native Americans were relocated from either the Southeast or Midwest to the Oklahoma Territory. Take the Cherokee tribe alone, 11,500 Cherokee were relocated or removed